Margie here. So many people suffer with bloating and IBS, and the good news is there's a lot that can be done. And we're going to delve into this topic with our very special guest, Dr. Ken Brown. And Dr. Brown received his medical degree from the University of Nebraska Medical School and completed his fellowship in gastroenterology in San Antonio, Texas. He is a board-certified gastroenterologist and has been in practice for over 15 years with a clinical focus on inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome. Dr. Brown declared that his mission is to bridge the gap between medical and natural science. For over a decade, he has been conducting clinical research for various pharmacologic companies. Dr. Brown recognized an unmet need for something natural that could help his IBS patients find real relief. After developing the only all-natural and clinically proven answer for IBS and bloating for over six years, a Trontiel launched in the summer of 2015. Dr. Brown developed a Trontiel to help those suffering from the symptoms of IBS, which we now know are caused by bacterial overgrowth. So there's lots of great information in this episode, so stay tuned. Welcome, Dr. Brown. I am so thrilled to have you here. I know we talked about being a guest on my podcast years ago, before it was even a podcast, when I, when I was thinking about osteoporosis and what you've done with digestion, and I was like, oh, you'd be the perfect guest, but it's taken a while. So welcome, welcome. Well, thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. And Margie, if you remember when we were talking then and you said, you know, I'm thinking of doing a podcast. And I said, if you get a podcast off the ground, I want episode 55. That's my favorite <laughs> number. Contact me when you're at 55. And you did. That's awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here. And the reason that I'm so excited is because so many of the people I see, whether it's for osteoporosis or whether it's just for happiness or whether it's just for general health, people are having bloating, they're having, they're, they're, they're just having issues and there's not, they just, or they have IBS and they just feel they have to live with it. And the issue is it doesn't have to be. And I was so excited when I met you and you told me about all the research and all the work you've done and your product that's been helping people that I said, I have to have you on. But, you know, before we even get started and everything, I, I have to tell you this story because you don't know this story. All right. So when we met, and this is years ago, and I don't even know when your product came out. Was it 2015 or? Right around 2015. Yeah. When we had our kind of soft launch. Yeah. Right. So it hadn't been out very long and we were at a conference and you gave, you sent me samples. So I had some bottles of a Trontiel. And I'd been using with patients, getting good results. And then I went to the beauty salon where I get my hair cut. And I was talking to the person doing my hair and what, what I did and different things. It was a new person. My person was out. And he was saying, oh, the woman who's the receptionist suffers with SIBO. And she's young. She's in her early 20s. And she's just miserable. Maybe you could speak with her. And I thought, sure, I'm happy to help. So afterwards, we talked for a little. And she's tried everything and was so unhappy and has no money. And it was just a real sad story. A young person did every diet, did everything. Anyway, so I said to her, I said, you know, I, you're going to have to ask your doctor about this. And I, don't, I rarely do this. But I just was thinking, that, you know what? Let her try one of the bottles that you gave me. I said, you know what? I don't typically do this, but I just have this gut feeling about this ask your doctor and I'm going to bring you, I live really close. So I said, you know what? I'm going to bring over tomorrow this bottle. Call your doctor, make sure it's okay. But I've been having really great results. Anyway, so I, I guess I, she didn't call me, but I, she doesn't really know my number. So I was back there maybe a month later and she is Margie. I can't thank you enough. I'm honestly in a month. She was like a different person and she was she couldn't thank me enough. She said now she's on some support group and she was telling everybody about it, but it was completely life-changing. And I would say she still worked there maybe six months after that. And then she left. So I don't know what happened to her, but that whole time she was well and she just got her life back. So it was really, really incredible. And that's, that's what I've seen. So I just think it's amazing that the whole world doesn't know about this and 
you know, why don't you start by telling us <laughs> why you created it? Let's start there and what you've seen, you know, with your patients that there was a need for something more. Yeah. So my background, much like your brother, um, I'm a, I'm a board certified gastroenterologist. I was traditionally trained, meaning that I went to med school, did my residency, did my fellowship. And about 12, 15 years ago, the time flies now, I, got, um, I started doing clinical research in the pharmaceutical industry, mostly for a for-profit thing. And so whenever a drug comes out through the FDA, they have to go through these different processes. So I was doing this work looking at different things for irritable bowel syndrome, IBS. Happens to affect about 20% of the population. And it was at that time when I'm working with these drug companies that there was this big unmet need. I'm talking to scientists around the world and they're all going, but the problem is we'll never fix the bloated, constipated person because it appears that the reason is, is that they may be producing too much gas called methane that slows everything down. So that was my aha moment. I just went, wait a minute. So I worked with my research manager and we talked and we realized that in the cattle industry, they've been trying to decrease methane production for a very long time using natural food products. That began this whole journey of finding all this data and realizing there's not a whole lot difference. The same type of gases being produced in our ruminants are creating the same problems causing irritable bowel syndrome. So over the next several years, we're able to figure out a combination to actually get rid of the gas, get rid of the bloating. And it was all based on a bloated cow thinking about it. And then you realize these molecules are actually really good for you. They're called polyphenols. These polyphenols are what make vegetables colorful, fruits and vegetables very colorful. So my aha moment was this, I'm doing pharmaceutical research, completely traditional. And then I just went, oh my gosh, we've got a natural solution here that nobody has figured out yet. And that kind of became the rest of my career. So for the last 12 years, I kind of have considered myself bridging this gap between traditional medicine and natural solutions. And there is a ton of research out there and very exciting that we're able to develop something. That's, I love hearing stories like that. As a still practicing gastroenterologist, I tend to get the, only the people that have failed everything and I get them from all over now. And uh, so I like hearing that I don't get the super successes because they don't show up to my office. I just get the people that come in with a bucket full of stuff and go, nothing has worked, including your product. I'm like, uh oh. <laughs> and so there's still a lot of work to do. And I'm not saying it's going to work on everybody. But as you know, in healthcare, that you, you just, you try and do your best. I want to back everything by clinical science and research. But I also understand that a lot of the research, so for instance, in my world, in the academic world, a lot of these, um, let's call them academic institutions, you know, they're very stringent about what they see, but who pays for that? And the people that can afford to pay for it are essentially drug companies. I would love to be in a position where my goal, if you ask me my 10 year goal, it would be that we sell our product for a lot of money and then I can reinvest that money into natural solutions and say, no, the things that we have been talking about, for instance, um, how much, great research is shown on like the book that you wrote exercises for osteoporosis. <laughs> so we could sit there and say, Oh, look, Margie, I want to sit with you. Let's do a study and show that front squats uh, build up greater bone density in the femur than back squats or something like that. <laughs> it's, but somebody has to pay for it at some point. So that's sort of the problem. But that's my background. I found an unmet need. We discovered a natural way to do it. And it's really just exploded and taken off. And that's the it's the beauty of pursuing a passion, a dream. Well, the nice thing about your dream, though, is that nobody, nobody wants gas and bloating. And I think too often it's just overlooked, like, oh, yeah, no big deal. But it is a big deal because it's saying some, there's a problem. And when we think of the bones, it, if, if digestion is an issue, if people aren't absorbing their nutrients and there's some problem, it needs to be addressed before people start going on medication for osteoporosis. And I think this is such a root cause that's so often overlooked that I, I just think it's great, the work that you've done. So why don't you tell us about, let's talk, I guess let's talk about gas and bloating and how this really, and, and the polyphenols in terms of how this really disrupts the methane gas 
and really makes a big difference for people. So when I started this journey, it was to help people with irritable bowel syndrome, which is essentially what I'm describing. This brilliant doctor named Dr. Mark Pimentel um, out of um, Cedar sinai um, figured out that in an animal model, that if you can take an animal, put it either, give it antibiotics, put it under stress, or possibly it has an infection, well, then about 20% of the animal models that he had showed that they had bacteria growing where they should called bacterial overgrowth. And that is the model that we're able to describe that, oh, wow, IBS is not in your head. It's actually a physical thing that's going on in your intestines, which is bacteria growing where they shouldn't be. Then every time you eat, the bacteria break it down and produce this gas. So I developed Atrontil for the gas and bloating. Now we start fast forwarding and we start unraveling what's really going on. I'm very biased as a gastroenterologist, but I truly believe that all health begins and ends in your gut. And so, other people said that too. Yes, <laughs> Didn't Aristotle so, say that? <laughs> a few other, a few other people. I, I, I trademarked it. So, they can, they can, no. um, so basically, I, I generally believe that all health begins and ends in the gut. There's new evidence to show that when you have intestinal inflammation, it leads to what we're going to call leaky gut permeability. So if I'm talking to a doctor, I'm going to say intestinal permeability. If I'm talking to a patient, I'm going to say you have leaky gut. How do I know this? Because you've got these other inflammatory markers circulating in your blood. We know that a lot of people that develop GI issues then start developing autoimmune issues. I'll go so far as to say that one of the uh, causes of two epidemics, one of them is in, your, actually probably both are in your space, obesity and osteoporosis they're now seeing is related to oxidative stress or cellular inflammation. So how do you get that? Well, if we're taking in a diet, which is uh, an inflammatory diet, you're continually hitting your body and you raise these inflammatory patterns. You end up having intestinal permeability and that can do many different things. Uh, one of the things it can do is it can lead to autoimmune disease, which is why there's all these autoimmune diets that people go on because we want to protect the gut. We now know that people with dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, show up 10 years earlier with intestinal issues. So protecting your intestines, protecting your barrier of everything that you're bringing in is important for everything. It's imperative for everything, including osteoporosis, dementia. So we started out thinking, I'm going to fix the bloating, which makes you feel miserable because I get a lot of, you know, that's what people, that's what they come to see me for. And then I ask questions like, do you feel more fatigued than usual? And they're like, yes. Do you ever feel like you're in a brain fog? I'm like, oh my goodness, yes. How's your sleep pattern? It's been messed up. Why are you asking this? I'm at a gastroenterologist. I'm like, it's the same reason why your physical therapist will ask you if you're happy. So it's, an, <laughs> it's, it's a whole body thing and it's a brain gut thing. So it's when I see people that have that, I know that they've got more than just bloating going on. And it's almost like the bloating becomes the icing on the cake, but I'm going to prevent you from having other problems down the line, including osteoporosis, dementia, autoimmune disease. Wow. So it's, so it's blocking the methane. It's helping get rid of the methane. And then the polyphenols are what's reducing the oxidative stress. Is that, do I have that correct? Correct. So, um, we, I, it's almost like we found what they had done some research on. And now I'm finding, now I'm working with these biochemists all over the world. I'm doing Zoom calls in Spain and in Italy and Argentina. And I've got PhD patients that I'm meeting with. And I'm just like, this is crazy how many people know so much about this. And it's just not being put out there. You're going to see so much about the polyphenolic science and what it does in the body because we're starting to unravel why the Mediterranean diet is such a health e diet and why people that eat a traditional Mediterranean diet tend to have less diabetes, less um, strokes, less cancer, less everything. And it could be because of these molecules. So Atrantil, the way it works is we put three polyphenols together, which is peppermint, horse chestnut extract, and something called Quebracho Colorado, which is kind of the workhorse. That is, and all three of them are stable polyphenols, meaning that they're very large molecules. So when we were trying to figure out what would be the best natural compounds to treat people with bacterial overgrowth, 
We needed it to be able to survive gastric acid. We needed it to be able to survive the basic environment of the duodenum, the next part, and the pancreatic enzymes, and to be poorly absorbed. So it didn't get absorbed into your bloodstream. So let's say you have an issue going on in your intestines, and I give you an antibiotic that's built to be absorbed right away. Well, then it's a systemic antibiotic, and it can do more damage than good because I'm trying to get something right here. So we we put those three polyphenols together that work so that it calms the area down. Then one of them comes in, the cabracho weakens the type of bacteria that produces a certain gas called methane. And then the other one shuts off the enzyme, which is why in our clinical trials, we, we had so much success. We had like 88% success in our first one. And then we treated people that failed everything and had incredible success. So I tell my patients, look, four out of five people, not to use the old bad dental commercials when they would always say four to five days, <laughs> but literally our studies show that four out of five people, if you bloat, you're going to get better. And when you don't, I start looking for other things. So that was the bloating aspect. And then all these scientists started calling me. They're like, how did you know to use Cabracho for this? I'm like, well, it was working through different chemists in the past. We realized it did this. They're like, I did my thesis on this. Can I tell you what I've learned on this? And I was like, yeah. So next thing I know, I'm Zooming with this incredible PhD in Spain. And she's like, oh, look at, look at what I did. And then she showed, oh my goodness, wow. When it doesn't get absorbed, it goes to your microbiome. This is where your microbiome, I'm going to throw out a new term that few people are using and you're going to hear everybody talk about it five years from now. We, you know, you've heard of probiotics and of sometimes course. some people have heard of prebiotics, which is their fiber. Well, the coolest thing now is postbiotics. And what that is, is there's a whole field of science. And I don't mean like, um, oh, some people think of it. I mean, like there's people getting their PhDs in this one aspect. It's so cool that you can show when these molecules make it to the colon, your colonic bacteria, if you have a healthy microbiome, and I always hold my hands up like this, because if you have a diverse microbiome, then your microbiome, meaning your bacteria, that you walk around with. So all of us, every listener here has like a hundred trillion bacteria that you, that help you to survive. We don't really know if we're here for them or they're here for us. Either way, when you treat them nice, meaning you feed your, your own microbiome, what it wants to eat, it will do very amazing things for you, including breaking down these polyphenolic compounds into beneficial things. So her research showed that when you have this stable polyphenol like this, a large one, it gets broken down almost like it, think of like a large Lego model. And then as it's moving down, people just keep knocking off a piece here and there, a piece here and there, whenever they need one. If they go, oh, I need, hey, um, do you have a red urolithin? Urolithin is a molecule that has now been shown to cause what's, called mitophagy. And what that is, is it allows your body to realize when a cell is not functioning well, they're like, we don't really want this one in production anymore. Let's just shut this down. Let's get some new mitochondria in here and do it. It's, it's a way to keep your cells new, which is why it's probably an anti-aging molecule as well. So the body decides, your microbiome says, we need some urolithin here. It's like, oh, we need some more butyrate here because we're seeing some inflammation over there. You let your body decide what it actually needs. And so these postbiotics are the anti-inflammatory molecules. They can cross the blood-brain barrier. They can do uh, incredible things. And so now when we've been sitting there thinking, hey, we're trying to manipulate the microbiome, we're getting these stool studies, we're saying, take some probiotics, do this, do that. The future is in about giving your microbiome what it wants and letting it decide what it needs to do. It's crazy. Wow, this is amazing. So what you're saying is that a tronteal, because of the polyphenols, are also acting as a postbiotic and have this potential. Yeah, so this doctor's wow. research was incredible. She showed that you can take the cabracho and the cabracho and chestnut, the, and hers was a hydrolyzed. Anyways, the, the chemistry gets really, in, really <laughs> cool. Cause then you start going, Oh, that makes sense here that, you know, you're dusting off organic chemistry that you took in college. 
And um, well, what she was able to show is that the larger, more stable polyphenol, then she was put it in with um, essentially feces so that it could see what happens when it gets broken down. And then she showed the rise in butyric acid, which is butyrate, which is a short chain fatty acid that we all need. Then she okay. showed this rise. And what was fascinating to me was then she was able to show that all these smaller phenolic compounds started being kicked off. And what that means is nobody knows anything about Cabracho. I'm one of the few people with a handful of other PhDs, but other people have heard of things like turmeric or they've heard of quercetin or they've heard of mercetin or these different things. Have you heard of quercetin? Oh, of course. I use that. Absolutely. Yes. I bet a lot of the people listening, everyone's heard of turmeric. That's for sure. And I so, would say, yeah. But not, crazy. not the new one, not, not the one that you're. Well, collecting. there's just, I mean, she has like. <laughs> Aquar she has the like, um, cabaracha. How do you pronounce it again? Cabaracho. 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 Okay. <laughs> so the cabaracho, and then she showed, oh, through mass spec, it kicks off quercetin. It kicks off your lithin. It kicks off this. And then you start realizing, oh my gosh, this is exactly what it is. So all the research that's going on, and we're in the midst of right now in episode 55, we're in the midst of our a little COVID. We're six months into the whole COVID <laughs> thing. You're going to start hearing more about this in the COVID aspect, because as it turns out, these polyphenols actually block, they work as anti-protease inhibitor. And we got tons of data on this. But the most exciting thing is, is that I've recently learned that all these other small phenolic compounds that you're purchasing are all pieces of a larger, big Lego piece. Does that make sense? It does. It's incredible. Yeah. How so I'm working, with, I'm working with these scientists in Argentina that like produce this and they've known this and they're like, how, I mean, because they've been in the cattle industry and the wine industry and they're multi-billion dollar company. And I'm like, you guys are missing, you guys need to get out there for humans. And so that's how we started working with them. And now we've become very good friends because they're like, wow, you took our product that we've had for 30 years that we've just used for cattle and wine and made it into a human thing. And now you're, so now these other scientists are going, well, if it's working like that, then we can do this. And yeah, it's, it's oh, so Oh, this is cool. so exciting. So what have you seen? Because you've been with patients. What have you seen in terms, because what I have seen is that the gas and the bloating gets much better. And then I know how the gut is related to everything else in the body. So it's just, plus I've been helping them with their diet and exercise and happiness. So there's so many other things that have gotten better with this improvement. So you know what I'm saying? The gut gets better, then everything gets better. But it's also possible that the polyphenols have, have had a you know, play in this. So what have you seen when you're you know, with the treatment, with just on Trontil, what have you seen in terms of besides the gas and the bloating? And I guess so, the dysbiosis gets better as well. So, yeah, yeah, so you end up having this, you know, microbial diversity. And it's really funny because there's two sides to this. And there's multiple sides to this. It just depends on which day you catch me and which mood I'm in. <laughs> because, you know, the first was, wow, there's this need that needs to be met. And it's just purely scientific. And then when we did the trials and my patients were coming in going, this is incredible. that You, you figured something out. And so I'm like, ah, oh, that can't be right. And then we did another trial. And I was like, that's, ah, you know, just total self-doubt. And then it's like, well, let's try and start a company. Now I've, now I'm part of a, you know, I'm, I'm a, a owner of a startup company that you're just like, then you just shift gears and you're like, oh my gosh, I hope it's that same. You can talk to your brother about this, but I think generally speaking, most physicians, especially with this deep into the specialist field, you know, it's the whole, um, let's just not hurt anybody. <laughs> especially if you go into gastroenterology, it's, it's, you're, you're almost a surgeon, but you just kind of don't have that quite cavalier you know i want to crack somebody open at 3 a.m it's like i want to go home to my family after scoping you know, 10 people. <laughs> so there's still this kind of a um, neurotic aspect where you know you're treating people and, and so then it went from oh my gosh we had this idea to oh my gosh we started a business to wow and then after we launched it was you know we went really focused to the bloated SIBO person and then the public came back to us and said, I feel better taking it. My bloating's better, but I just feel better when I'm on it. And then that's what started into the whole everyday use thing where it's like, wait a minute, this actually functions like this. And so if you can think of it this way, let's, let's turn it to happiness. And I'm a huge, that's why I thought it was, I didn't realize that you're into the whole happiness thing. I am all about um, the gut brain connection. And I'm 
you know, I've got, and I'm all about trying to at least show with science, maybe it's not a large randomized placebo controlled trial out of Johns Hopkins and a few other institutions. Maybe it's an animal model that shows something. Maybe it's a doctor like Satish Rao out of Atlanta that just had a small number of people. What he did is he showed that people with SIBO uh, that tended to have, when they took certain probiotics, which increased the lactic acid, they had more anxiety and depression than those that had lower levels, which totally fit with animal models showing that inflammatory mediators from the gut can cross the blood brain barrier, causing inflammation in the brain, resulting in anxiety, sleep issues, possibly even depression and things like that. So that's perfectly tied together when you start talking to happiness. So yeah, it's, it's all related. Actually, can you just talk about SIBO for those people that don't know exactly what SIBO is? Because not everyone with IBS even realizes that they, and I, I think a lot of people have SIBO, but they're just given the term IBS. So can you sort of just for those listening, maybe clarify what that is and, and how, I guess, yeah, clarify when you're given the term IBS what that really means and how that's typically treated, I guess. Yeah. So irritable bowel syndrome is the most common diagnosis that if you're a gastroenterologist or most probably common diagnosis that doctors will probably make. And the reason why is because we call it a trash can diagnosis. Essentially, if you have a change in bowel habit associated with pain, relieved with defecation, then over four months, you meet the definition of irritable bowel. I've hated that definition. Even as a, as a resident and fellow, I'm like, wait a minute. We have irritable bowel, but you can have constipation and you can have diarrhea. Those are opposing symptoms. It's like if you have a migraine with a headache or without a headache, it doesn't make any <laughs> sense. I mean, it's a migraine. You got a headache. So I felt it was kind of late and I felt, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to like attack my industry, but it was this ability to do this. And the reason why is because these people would come in and you would do an endoscopy and a colonoscopy and draw blood work and get an x-ray and then pat the patient on the head and say, good news, you just have irritable bowel syndrome. And then they walk off and then the treatments get a little unusual where frequently it was giving somebody an antidepressant which you will see very similar with fibromyalgia. You'll see it with chronic pelvic pain. You'll see it with these restless leg syndrome, things like that where we don't really understand why they're experiencing this. It must be in your head. 30 years ago, ulcers were caused by stress and ulcers were caused by um, type A personalities. And so ulcers were treated with antidepressants and um, anxiolytics. And then an Australian gastroenterologist said, no, 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 I believe they're caused by bacteria. And he almost died and ended up winning the Nobel Prize by taking helicobacter bacteria and say, it's not in my head, I'm bleeding out from an ulcer. And that is the same paradigm shift that's taking place right now with irritable bowel. I'm in a bit of the minority with my colleagues where I've embraced it really early on, where I saw Dr. Pimentel's research from the very beginning, and it was brilliant. So I embraced the whole idea that you don't have irritable bowel. So I did the original studies on IBS for Zyfaxin, and we had, I was the leading enrolling site in the country. I know this because I had an FDA audit, and I will never quite recover. I got a few gray hairs from that one. <laughs> and, uh, that, and so I have a really large IBS population, but I never call anybody IBS because the second you do, then you kind of quit thinking about what else could be going on. Is it gluten sensitivity? Is it a food sensitivity? Is it possible that it's a cold crone, celiac disease, whatever? So irritable bowel, if you're listening and you've been told you have irritable bowel, then there is a possibility that you may be having bacteria growing where it shouldn't be, which is bacterial overgrowth. So now we talk about SIBO. So irritable bowel, um, the pain is actually caused by distension or gas. So if you go through a stressful event, if you've had antibiotics, if you've had an infection, then there is the possibility that it shocks a part of your intestine called the small bowel. And when it doesn't move for a little bit, bacteria can start to grow because we take in bacteria all the time. Every time you put something in your mouth, it's got bacteria on it. And if it starts to grow, then when you eat, the bacteria are having a little buffet. They're just having a little party because they're hanging out on vacation in a place where they shouldn't be. 
they should be in your colon breaking down these beautiful polyphenols so that you can have the postbiotic effect. But they happen to be grown where they shouldn't. So my classic patient is somebody that said, you know, four years ago, I went to a different country. I got really sick. My wife and I got horribly sick. She's fine. Ever since then, now, every single time that I eat specifically carbs, I really blow up. And I, it's, it's, I can see it like 30 minutes after I eat. And then I ask those questions. Do you ever feel like you're in a brain fog? Do you feel like you have fatigue? Do you feel like da, da, da? And they're just like, yes, yes. And they've usually been to a few other doctors. And I'm like, okay, it's probably this. This is probably what's going on. It's bacterial overgrowth. You have bacteria growing where you shouldn't. And then that's becomes a whole, that's been a moving ship about how do we diagnose? How do we actually nail the, you know, how do we agree to the terms and all this stuff? But fortunately, as a non-academic doctor, or on my terms, academic, I should say, the research we do is here, I'm, I have a really busy practice. So I treat, I see, I see what's working. We adapt, we try and add. So it's a continually moving process. Bottom line is, if somebody says you have IBS, they want to put you an antidepressant. Maybe we can get to the underlying cause. And I'm such a big believer, and I love the work you do, that where you're getting to the root cause, because you need to, to just mask the symptoms isn't going to help anybody. And so that's, that's really terrific. So I have a question for you then. So if someone has these issues that, you know, they're every time they eat and they do have possibly SIBO, do you not get the SIBO, the, the test first? Do you, do you believe in getting the test first or do you believe in treating first and seeing if it works? Well, I have the advantage of getting people for second and third opinions. And normally that's not an advantage, but the advantage is, look, you've already spent a lot of money. A lot of times they'll do the traditional uh, physician route and then they'll spend a period doing the functional medicine route, which involves a lot of cash pay. So I get a lot of people to come in. So I've uh, adapted my practice to look, if four out of five people are going to get better on this, let's treat you. If you don't get better, then let's come back and let's start digging a little bit deeper. Because if you walk like a duck and quack like a duck. Now, this is very different from the academic people um, like Dr. Pimentel, like Allison Seebecker up in um, uh, Oregon. And, you know, wonderful people. And they're, they're very specialized in that. I still have a very robust practice where I'm like, look, I've got an attorney that's like, listen, man, I took, I, you know, I took court off today. Can you? Can we figure something out? I spent a lot of money doing this. So my, my approach is a little less academic, a little bit more practical, where I'm like, I'm going to treat you. And if I treat you with what I think should work and you don't get better, then I start thinking testing. And I know that that is in stark contrast to a lot of the other people that are publishing in this space. And they should have very hard criteria, meaning that this breath test showed this methane thing. If you're going to go see Dr. Rao and in uh, Georgia, he's going to say, I'm going to do a PCR culture on you. And if you go to the Mayo Clinic, they've got their protocols. So I have quite a bit of success just saying, look, let's, let's treat you. If you get better, we're heading in the right direction. That's kind of what it is. Wow. So is there anyone this would be contraindicated for? So someone who's listening has bloating and they've been told they have IBS and they're just living with it and they have osteoporosis and they have brain fog <laughs> and, and they're living with this. So is there any contraindication to taking the Atrontel? Well, deal? the medical, well, the medical legal terms would be the same things on the box. And this just comes down to making sure that we don't really, we've never studied in pregnant women. We've never studied it in nursing. We didn't study it in kids. So we know that. And then, so that's the, we have no idea. I mean, I've had a lot of kids. My, my kids have taken it. The, um, the co- producer with me she took it while she was pregnant and breastfeeding but that's but we say don't please don't just because we don't have any data on that and then I personally as a physician I'm very careful with drugs that have narrow therapeutic window in other words if you're somebody who's on a blood thinner like Coumadin then we don't know what anything else will interact with it if you're on an anti-rejection medicine like you've had a kidney transplant I don't even want to mess around with this. So I tell all my patients and I have a lot of those patients have gut issues and they're begging. And I'm just like, I'm not going to risk that. So I'm pretty hard stance on the pregnant breastfeeding. And if you're narrow therapeutic window drugs, but other than that, um, unless you have an allergy to something in it, we've had, you know, we've, we've had a lot of people on this now, you know, we launched about five years ago and we've got, 
hundreds of thousands of people that have taken it. And so. Cause four out of five is incredible that it helps. Bloating is, is amazing. So four out of five with the proper symptoms. So, yeah. and I only say that because if you're somebody, if you're looking for a pure laxative, it's not a laxative and it's not a weight loss product. If you're, if you, if, if what I said resonates with you, chances are you're going to get better. If you go, yes, I eat and I look four months pregnant. That's totally it. Those are the people that I feel very confident with. When somebody says it didn't do anything, I didn't lose any weight. I'm like, it was never supposed to be a weight loss product. It was never supposed to be a pure laxative. It is very specific for that. You're still going to get the benefits, the long-term benefits of these polyphenols, which will play out over the next several years in a really cool, exciting way. But for the person that wants to take this for symptoms, that's what you should do. And I guess always, if you have other things, it's best to check with your doctor and just make sure that. Yeah. Yeah. You, um, do you have a, now you, do you mostly deal with osteoporosis? Well, it's interesting. So I've been dealing with osteoporosis for, for the past over 25 years. And I got into it as a physical therapist and realized that, you know, people were just going on medication. I was sort of realizing then afterwards how my son got diabetes and I saw firsthand how powerful food was. And that was completely missing really in osteoporosis treatment. And then I ended up going back to someone help my son with the diabetes. And I asked her, you know, where did you get this training? And it went off at that there's a missing link in osteoporosis. And so then I went back to school, studied and became a health coach and continue studying the relationship between nutrition and your bones and root cause in functional medicine. So I've seen firsthand how these, you must, must, must deal with the digestive issues. It's sort of like a hose where, you know, you're trying to eat the food and you're just not absorbing. So it's, you know, that someone's st stomping on the hose. You have to <laughs> have your whole digestive system working. So that's how I've gotten so into that. And then the happiness, you know, people stress, just like you said, stress and happiness have been shown to be related to bone density, you know, it, and everything, all health issues. So it's sort of the whole picture, I believe, is, is important. So the whole happiness aspect yeah. is, a, is, a, is a different thing. Like I've got this, my, my wife gets super frustrated because I'll just, I, uh, first of all, I'm an Amazon prime addict and I'll listen to a podcast and suddenly stuff starts showing up and she's just like, what is this? And I'm like, what was that podcast? Oh, that was the happiness lab. Oh yeah. Okay. So this is <laughs> <a> <laughs> I'll forget what I'm ordering. Cause I'll just be out. Like I'll be out for a run in the morning and I'll just be like, Oh, I need that. Um, oh, but it so works. It's, it's so, it's breath so work now and all the stuff, you know. Oh really my cool. gosh. It is. I mean, that's what I found as a physical therapist. I had had a bad situation myself and everybody was like, Margie, you're so happy. What do you do? And I thought, hmm, if they only knew what I had gone through, they wouldn't say that. But I realized that, you know, I sort of was happy and I realized like, what were the habits I did? And I started teaching those. This is 35 years ago. It's teaching those to my patients. And all of a sudden, chronic pain, TMJ, neck pain started getting better. And I saw how incredibly powerful this was. But anyway, we could talk forever because you have so much good information. This is so exciting though. Well, I here, I want to make get it over this. Wow. So one of the things that does bring me happiness is um, doing a podcast like this where I'd be quite honestly, I just don't have the bandwidth to look into osteoporosis. And so this morning I was like, oh, I'm going on Margie's podcast. I'm like, I really want to bring some value to her listeners. And there it is. I, st I, I work with the, this fantastic graduate student who's a nutritionist. And uh, I'm like, look, I'm going to go on uh, Margie's podcast. Can you, can you pull up some articles? We share a Mendeley account. So I've got thousands and thousands and thousands of articles. And so I'm just looking at this. I'm like, wow, never really linked the two together. But as it turns out, let's talk polyphenols and osteoporosis just for a few minutes because it brings me joy to find something that I just learned this morning. Oh, and you're um, going to tell all these people about it. So, yay. yeah. So <laughs> part of the problem when we say polyphenols is they're a large family. So when people read articles, they read these very um, complex words when they don't, when I just got done telling you earlier that really what they are is they're just little Lego pieces of the larger molecule because these researchers are studying certain smaller molecules. So keep that in mind. So um, we look at, when you look at, like let's say Japan and they have less osteoporosis, but they're traditionally, you would look at them. They're very lean, 
small, you'd think, okay, well, some people believe that it's because of the soy, um, of the soybean. It's got some isoflavones is what's in it, possibly estrogen-like activity. And I was like, okay, well, that's kind of goes, I don't really want to recommend that kind of thing because then we start talking, you know, the estrogenetic effect of different things. So then start looking at it and realize, well, there's 8,000 polyphenols that have been at least documented. We know that 500 of them have been really researched looking at the bioactivity. So then I found this incredible review article that said, how polyphenols can improve osteoporosis. Here you go. So five-step mechanism. They preserve bone health by the action of one, decreasing bone loss through the activity of antioxidants. As it turns out, inflammation turns on osteoclasts, which results in more uh, loss of the bone structure. So inflammation, key word to everything, happiness. Absolutely. Inflammation, yep. inflammation. We have to block this inflammation. Number two, diminishing bone loss through the direct anti-inflammatory action. And they go into the science of that, like NF-kappa B and these different things. But bottom line is reactive oxygen species, antioxidants, and decreasing directly inflammation. Number three, improving osteoblastogenesis. Wow. In other words, polyphenols turn on the cells that produce the bone. Osteoblasts. Genesis means to, you know, the beginning to produce. So this is the osteoblastogenesis. And then reducing osteoclastogenesis. Polyphenols turn on the cells that produce more bone and they decrease the cells that leach the bone, the osteoclast versus the osteoblast. And um, then they go into this really kind of wild osteoimmunologic activity. So we talk about, I talk about like brain gut, so to speak. Well, now that what they're talking about is gut bone, so to speak. And they were just going into some serious heavy science, but it's really cool. Bottom line is, is that many flavonoids, which is a subset of polyphenols, have displayed positive impact on bone metabolism. And then they discuss about how chronic disease leads to it. So maybe we should be taking polyphenols to stop the underlying disease, perhaps like obesity, perhaps autoimmune disease, which can all lead to, you know, more um, osteoporosis. And then they final, uh, the final thing about this is that they want to use a very good example of like olive tree extract. So olive tree is just uh, olives. We know that they're very good. They've got uh, lots of oils. And they were showing that uh, in addition to antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, antimicrobial, antiviral, cardioprotective, um, anti-ischemic, and affecting your lipids, they have been able to show in a dose-dependent bone-sparing effect that olive oil extract showing a reduction of bone loss in the same time. So every time they look at something that has the underlying mechanism of inflammation, reactive oxygen species and if that can turn on a disease process like osteoporosis those same things turn on disease processes like alzheimer's and dementia they turn on different processes like autoimmune disease polyphenols stop the the inflammatory cascade so it only makes sense that if you choose a disease you'll be able to show that it helps as long as it decreases inflammation so there's your polyphenol wow. to osteoporosis link could you do me a favor, Ken, and give me that link and I'll post it for everybody? Oh, yeah. I'll okay. find that. I've That's got... fine. You can just send it to me and I'll, I'll make yeah. sure it's, it's in. It's wow. not a very enjoyable read. That was but for anyone, point. there are people who are listening who might want to delve deeper into it. So that that's great. Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. We could speak so much because there's so many. But I, you have to feel so good, though. Doesn't it make you feel amazing that you went that extra step, you found a problem, and you really spent years researching it and now have and, and are changing lives every single day. You know, just that one woman. I mean, I look at the world and if you know, think about it, each life you change is amazing when someone can feel better and be happier and just lead a more productive life and just every ask it just has to bring joy to you. It brings joy to my heart that the work you've done. Because in just seeing what's happened, I didn't know when I, years ago, when you showed me your product, I'm like, oh, but then when I, I mean, I felt great with that woman that I decided to give her that, even though I don't usually give things to the receptionist at the beauty salon, but I was feeling so sad. I thought, you know, I have this bottle, speak to your doctor and her whole life changed. And so, but 
but good for you. I just think it's so amazing. And I think you should pat yourself on the back because it's really, it's really exciting. And it's even and so exciting too. what possibilities exist beyond what you created it for. It's amazing. Yes. It's super exciting. It's lovely, but I'm going to throw this back in your court and I'm going to lean on you as a health coach because like many people that are that are in the grind many uh, some of your listeners i mean it's the oh you should be so happy that you raised such wonderful kids that have gone <laughs> on to do amazing things but in the but in the throes of it it was staying up late doing homework you're not really you know you you lose the perspective of remaining happy so there have been times throughout this process raising money having a business going all the way to honolulu when we first launched and bumping into your brother and going like hey <laughs> my brother's a GI for everybody who's um <laughs> he's actually on the podcast and did a phenomenal interview on hope. He's not just a GI, he's a no, thought he's, leader in our in our He's American amazing. He's, he's, he's amazing. He's amazing. He's, and, and so he came is, to our booth and was just so nice. He's like, "Man, I wish you the best, but good luck cuz this is a and you know, it was just it was that naivety of just jumping off the dock and I'm like, I've got this incredible thing and then I realized, "Oh my gosh, it's still a business. You still have to do this." So the techniques that you use when you start feeling overwhelmed, I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. But you, you also should be super happy. You've developed this great um, health coaching. You've written a book, but there's, there could be times when you're overwhelmed. How do you gain control of it and gain perspective? Okay. So for overwhelm, I think there's a couple of things. I think living in the present, I think that's the key to stop thinking about the 20 million things that you can think of and just stop take some breaths and really live in the moment and really focus on like, if you focus on what you're doing right that minute, instead of thinking I have this to do, I have that to do, just stop, put all of your focus on this thing. Okay, then all of your focus on that. I think that really helps overwhelm. I also think not being a perfectionist, I really am, was a perfectionist and then I had to stop and say, you know what? 85% is okay and I think getting rid of that everything had to be perfect is huge for reducing overwhelm and just being grateful for what you're accomplishing and just being and that's what I was going to say to you gratitude you know gratitude changes stress it's really the antidote and so many people are grateful for your work but yeah so I think that I, I think you know not being a perfectionist living in the moment and then just appreciating the little and small steps you know what one step and i'm grateful i did that the next step i'm great and saying no saying no by saying no to things you truly don't want to do that says yes and leaves room for the things you want to do so i think that's a big one so often we commit to everything and just stopping before we say and people don't care i realize it's not as though people care if you say no they'd rather that than do a you know not do a very good job at something yeah. Does that That's answer awesome. your, there's a lot more, but does that answer your question on overwhelm? It does. Something that I've been working on, which is in the moment, it's a little bit more of the, um, because there have been, still having a practice, still doing this, there have been moments where it's like really overwhelming. Like there's a pressing thing that has to be done in the next hour and I've got other things. Um, a little bit of the stoic philosophy of that, that thought is literally a thought. It does not have to become an emotion. And that's what I'm really trying to work on because I think that the, I mentioned earlier the neuroses. I mean, to get to this point and to get through med school and residency and this and that, you got to have a certain level of neuroses and type A and, and things. And now I'm like trying to realize that not every single thought should have an emotion. If I get called and a patient is bleeding, that thought should have an emotion. And I allow that. But when I get called and say that our production is going to be delayed by a week it would normally create the same emotion as somebody i need to go save a life and now i'm learning to go it's it'll it'll all work out that one's okay so it's allowing myself to have the emotion when it's important and trying to realize that stoic philosophy of it is just a it is a thought whether you want it to be an emotion or not is your choice so that's fabulous i spend i, I teach an eight-week happiness course and the second, mod, the second module, right, is all on our thoughts and what we can do because we are swarming with negative thoughts. And the problem is when you give, just like you said, when you give weight to that thought, it, it's, the body doesn't know any difference and the body reacts as though it's reality. 
So just a big thing is questioning the thought. Is that true? Is it, I mean, there's work by Byron Katie that I love called the work, you know, and where you really start questioning your thoughts because it can drive you crazy and it can make you very, very sick and totally destroy your gut. <laughs> so let's tie in your thought with osteoporosis in the gut. When you have a thought and you allow it to create the emotion, that allows the fight or flight system to kick in. And when that happens, it's good in the short term. But if it is a low level chronic thing, then that leads to inflammation. The same thing we're trying to avoid. So literally the, the, body brain connection, you can control it from both ways. You can heal your gut to protect your brain. And when your brain starts getting a little too much, you can control that so that your fight or flight doesn't kick in. And it's true. They've shown, they've shown increased cortisol, the stress hormone reduces, increases the osteoclast, reduces the bone building cells, the osteoblast. So they've actually shown, and they've shown, you know, increased cortisol reduces bone density. So there's actually studies on this. So oh. yeah. Yes. Oh. So, yeah. So it's well, all I treat, I treat inflammatory bowel disease where I use as little as possible, but we use a corticoid called prednisone and we know that prednisone does the exact same thing. So when you have cortisol, it's very similar in structure to prednisone and prednisone by definition, I have to make sure they don't develop osteopenia and osteoporosis even in my young patients. Yeah. So yeah, it makes total sense. Anyway, we can talk for so long, but this has been so much fun. You'll, and I'm really excited. So I also have a link for people. So to learn about a Tronseal, they can just, I'll have the link in the show. Yes, notes. we'll have links. They'll be able to get, your, your audience will be able to get some discounts and so on. And this is just really exciting. I just, I love the work that you're doing. I like how you've come around as physical therapist leading to osteoporosis and this whole happiness thing and embracing the gut health. So that's awesome. I'm really proud of what you're doing. Oh, well, thank you. And I'm so glad that we got to talk and I'm just excited for what's happened with your product. It's amazing. So and I'm so thrilled that you held true to your promise to give me episode 55. <laughs> I know that there was like 20 people that wanted that. Yes, yes, there's I a whole line. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ken. It's been such a pleasure. Absolutely, Margie. Thank you. Stay well. Thanks.